Thank you guys for being here today. I'm so excited that you are with us on this holiday weekend, whether you're here in the room or you're watching online. Today is going to be an absolutely fantastic day. In fact, it already has been. Um, in just a few moments later on in this uh, gathering together, we are actually going to have an opportunity to take communion together. And so you've probably seen that in front of you, as uh, Justin mentioned earlier. So if you're at home watching online, uh, you can if, run to your pantry, find some wheat thins. I don't know. That's don't, that's not sacrilegious, don't, don't do that. Okay, but you understand, like find something that you can use to, um, let's have communion together when we gather together during this time. It's going to be really exciting to kind of prepare our hearts and our spirits for that as we um, get ready. I wanted to kind of just open you guys with a story. We're going to take a journey today um, through a walk through the Bible a little bit to kind of see something that I think is, is really incredible. Um, but to kind of set that up, I want to tell you about uh, a vacation that I recently took. You know, a few weeks ago, my family and I, we were finally able to go on a vacation together, just, just us. And uh, we had one scheduled earlier this year that was, of course, disrupted. And like so many other things were disrupted. And so we finally, you know, we need to escape. We need to get out of here and just see a, a different change of scenery or something. Usually our go-to place with our family is Disney World, but nothing about that sounded appealing right now. So we said, you know what, let's do something different. Let's go to the mountains, because my kids haven't really been to the mountains, and so that would be a fun, kind of different change of pace for them. So we showed them pictures of the mountains. We're like, these are mountains. We're going to go there. And we showed them pictures of, like, caverns and things we were going to explore. We showed them, like, waterfall pictures. Like, hey, guys, this is going to be really fun that we get to go and do. And they were getting excited, and they were excited about it. And so we went uh, up to Asheville, and we had a nice room and everything. It was really great. And every day, we would say, here's where we're going to go today, and it would be like some mountainous place, okay? And so each day, we would kind of say, this is where we're going today. And as we were driving to whatever destination we had for that day, every single day, my son Graham, he's six, he would say, hey, Dad, where are the mountains? And I'd said, well, we're in the mountains. We say that a lot. When you're, if you've ever been in the mountains, you always say, we're in the mountains. And he said, well, where are they? I said, well... We're in it. We're on it. But I don't see them. Right, because we're on the mountains. And he, he would be like, but, but where are they? And it was like this vicious cycle. I don't know if you've ever tried to explain to somebody where mountains are when you're actually on a mountain. Uh, because as we're driving on these mountainous roads, you know, like, and I'm like weaving back and forth all over the place, and all you see is trees. All you see is rocks. Occasionally you might see a little stream or something, um, but that's it. Other than that, it looks like pretty much anywhere else when you're driving in the mountains. And so for him to ask the question, well, where are the mountains? And for me to say, well, you're on the mountain, that didn't compute. It didn't make a lot of sense. Because when you're on the mountain, sometimes you can't see the mountain, can you? And I think the same is true for us in life sometimes. We have these goals, we have these ideas of things that we want to set out to do, and we can see it, we can see the mountains, and mountains are majestic, mountains are glorious from a distance, we can see them in all of their beauty. In the fall, we can see leaves change color, we can see how awesome they are, but then we kind of get into our routine, we kind of get into the day of it, and suddenly we wonder, well, where is the mountain? Where is the goal? Where is the thing that was driving me before? I can't see it anymore. And you realize sometimes, oh, I'm just in it. And we can't always see that destination anymore. We get into our routine. We get into our rhythm of everyday kind of life. And we, if you're like me, like I have a bag. I pack every single day. And every single day I wake up with like these goals and ideas. I see the mountains in front of me that I'm going to accomplish this week or this month. The goals that I have, how I'm going to set out, how I'm going to accomplish that and I pack my bag in accordance with that mountain. I pack my bag with what I see far out in front of me. And so it might be my computer, my wallet, my phone. I put my keys in there. I need my charger for my computer, my charger for my phone. I need my watch. I need my calendar. I need all of these things. I always have a pen in my pocket. If you're wondering what that is, I always have a pen in my pocket just because it's like the thing that I always go to if I need it. I pack all these things into my day because I want to be ready for whatever's going to come my way because I can accomplish it. I want to attack that mountain. I want to go after it. And then I get into my routine in my week and I'm like, wait a second. Where is it? Interruptions come and all the stuff that I, I packed in my bag, I start using it. I'm like, where is it? 
where's the mountain? Oh, you're on it, but I can't see it anymore. And I don't just pack those physical things into my bag. You understand that every day we're also packing other things into our bag for the day, right? We pack in our worries. We pack in our anxieties. We pack in um, relationships that maybe we know are fractured. We pack in some bravado sometimes to make ourselves seem like we're better than maybe we actually are so that we can close that sale that day. We put an air in there. We might, we might put in all kinds of stuff into our bag throughout our day. We also put in our sin into our bag sometimes, maybe pride sometimes, other things that just kind of find their way in there. Our words get packed into there. Words that we think we want to say, th- words that we actually say, they all get packed into this bag during the day. And we go through our day and we go through our rhythm and we're like, well, where is the mountain? And we kind of lose sight of it. And if you're a follower of Jesus in this room or online, if you're a follower of Jesus, we have something else that we kind of look to as well. If if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're in a relationship with him, you also have, if you come to a gathering like this on Sunday into church, you you get a message, you get a word from God, you you have an anchor point for your week, and you go back to that anchor point hopefully throughout your week, and you say, all right, here is the one thing that I'm going to take away from that, and that's the, that's the mountain that I'm going to hit this week about how I can love my neighbor more, about how I can accomplish the one thing that God wants me to accomplish this week. And we can see it so clearly, and we go through our week, and maybe it's like Wednesday or Thursday, and we're just like, wait a second, what, what happened? I thought there was more to this. Because when we follow Jesus, he promises not just life, he promises abundant life. And we can see that mountain so clearly, but in our everyday kind of routine, we kind of miss it. We're like, well, where is that? And where is God in all of that? And as I read my Bible every day, that's another anchor point for my life every single day. And I go through my routine, I'm like, well, wait a second. Where is it? Where's the mountain? Where is God in all of this? And it's like he says, well, I'm right here. Okay, but then where's the thing that you prompt? Well, it's, you're on it. Everyday life. That's it. But isn't there more? Oh yeah, there's way more. You just can't see it yet. And that got me thinking a lot about something that's unique to us as followers of Jesus. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to pay attention close. And if you're not, and I would just ask you to kind of just open your mind a little bit to experience something that we're going to go on this journey together. And we're going to start with this one dynamic principle of our um, following Jesus, of what it means to to know him personally, and that's faith. And I I just want to level the field here to make sure that we're all operating with the same definition of faith for today, because we could probably describe it in different ways. I really love what Peter had to say about faith and how he described it. So we're going to start with that today as we walk through this. Peter said, you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now, because you're cleansed from your sins, you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. He says, cleansed from your sins. That that is salvation, right? When we are washed of our sins, when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ as the sacrifice for our sins, God's one and only sin, son who died on a cross for you and for me, who paid that penalty. If we put our faith and our trust in him and we ask him to forgive us of our sins, we are cleansed from our sins. And we were cleansed from our sins when we obeyed the truth. That to me is a really simple definition of what it means to have faith. Obedience to the truth. If you were to put that in like a calculation, we'd say faith equals obedience to the truth. And to kind of illustrate that, I have this nice chair here. Now, you may have seen this illustration before, but I just want to kind of bring it back up. This, let's just say that if faith is obedience to the truth, the truth of this chair is that if I sit in it, it will hold me up, right? And that is true whether I sit in this chair or not. But if I'm going to be obedient to this truth, it actually requires me to actually what? Sit in it. I have been obedient to the truth that I believe about this chair, and therefore, that is faith. Does that make sense? If this chair only had two legs, and I said, that chair will support me, that is not true, is it? And if I obey what is not true, I will fall, you thought I was going to fall, I will fall over. Because that isn't faith. So it requires both things. I can be obedient to something that is not true. And that is not faith. 
if I believe something about Jesus that is not true, like that's, that's not faith. Like, okay, he died, he was just a good guy, but he didn't really live, uh, he didn't really come back to life. Or he really wasn't God's son, right? Or I might be obedient to what I know is true. It requires both things. I can be disobedient to what I know is true. I can say that chair will support me, but I will never sit in it. I believe everything true about Jesus, but I never take the opportunity to surrender my life to him. That's not faith, is it? It requires me to be obedient to the truth. That's what Peter was saying. So keeping that definition in mind, I want us to kind of look at several examples today that the writer of Hebrews had kind of given us to look to as people who demonstrated what it meant to have faith before Jesus. And we're going to start, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11. So if you have your Bible or if you're looking in the app, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to get this really great uh, depiction of what it means for people like just like you and me who had faith. Here we go. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. That obedience to the truth shows the reality that I hope that chair is going to hold up. I believe it, right? It is the evidence of things that we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. I want you to make note of that phrase, good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. We believe that by faith, that what we now see did not come from anything that, cannot be, that can be seen. So the idea there is that we weren't there when God created everything, but we believe it to be true, and I'm going to live my life as if that is true. I'm going to be obedient to that truth, and I am made in God's image. The writer of Hebrews then goes on to kind of list like some amazing people. If you were to go back into the Old Testament and start seeing these individuals, some of them you will recognize, he starts listing these people out. And he talks about how Abel had faith when he offered a sacrifice to God. His brother Cain did not offer a true sacrifice to him. And as a result, Abel was killed. Enoch demonstrated faith. Noah had to have obedience to the truth because he uh, had to believe that what God was saying was true, that the entire world was going to be flooded and that Noah had to build an ark and that Noah had to persevere through that building of the arks to be obedient to the truth that God had given him at that time. Abraham, who was promised to be the father of an entire nation, God's chosen people, that he would have kids that would outnumber the stars in the sky and the sands on the beaches, on the earth. He was promised that and yet he didn't have a child. He had to be obedient to that truth. Now he actually took some things into his own hands. He actually messed up a lot. But even despite his sin, God still used him and kept his promise, was faithful to him even in that. Sarah also, who was very old when she had Isaac, she had every reason not to believe it. But in the end, she believed that God's promise was going to be true and therefore she was able to persevere. In the middle of this, the writer pauses for a moment and said, all these people, they all died still believing what God had promised them. They, he had been, promised them something and they lived their lives believing that it would come true. They did not receive what was promised meaning that they didn't live long enough to see all of it come to fruition, but they saw it all from a distance. They could see the mountain clearly from a long ways off, and they welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on the earth. They understood that God's kingdom was different than what they could see right in front of them. They understood that there was something more that God had promised them, and that this was just a part of a much bigger picture. He goes on to list even more people. Isaac. Jacob, Joseph, if you remember about Joseph, Joseph was someone who at a very young age, God called and said, I have an amazing plan for your life. In fact, one day, all of your brothers, your entire family, they're all going to bow down to you. And Joseph lived his life believing that to be true. And he, even through everything he went through, his brothers sold him into slavery. He was put into prison because lies were told about him. He eventually found himself to be in a position of power in Egypt. And sure enough, his brothers came 40 years later and bowed before him. 
he was obedient to the truth that God had given him and yet did not receive all that was promised. We have Moses, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, a man after God's own heart who had to believe that he would one day be king and despite everything that he went through, God fulfilled that promise. Samuel, the prophets, all of these people that God used, that he spoke truth to, that had to live their lives in obedience to it and we look at them as heroes of faith. They had faith despite everything that they were up against. But the writer of Hebrews concludes this list with this very interesting statement. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet, none of them, not one of those people received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they all of those who came before would not reach their perfection without us. You understand that all of those people who came before, they just could earn a good reputation. That was about as far as they could go. And they were all looking ahead for something more. And then guess what? Jesus shows up. Jesus comes, God in the form of man. Jesus comes. And he changes everything. Perfection. What it means to truly follow God. What it means to truly obey what is true. The one who is true. Jesus comes and shows us how to live. He pays the ultimate sacrifice so that everyone who had come before, anyone who would come after, if they put their faith and their trust in him, they can be forgiven of their sins and go beyond just a good reputation and achieve the perfection of their faith. It's incredible. And just like that, the writer tells us how everything has changed. The old promise, the old covenant eradicated in the person of Jesus, who is 100% God, 100% man, everything shifts. In Hebrews chapter 12, he tells us, therefore, since we are surrounded, that means everything, all, everything that I just read, everything that had come before, because of all of that, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, all of those people that we had just listed, and many, many more who had come before, to the life of faith, they're all witness to that, let us, you and I strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And we do this, how? By keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, being Jesus, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he... Jesus is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility that he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and you won't give up. That is incredible. You understand that everyone who came before, they could only get that good reputation, but we, Jesus, has called us to something bigger than that. He has called us into a different kind of mountain. He has called us to see that in our every day, we can actually experience the abundant life that he has for us. I want to kind of break down that whole passage a little bit and just kind of dissect it a little bit with you. Notice the first thing that Jesus initiates and perfects our faith. And I, that honestly, every time I think about that, it, I, I love that. I love that it's not up to me because I mess up all the time. Paul wrote in Ephesians, it is God's grace that saves us, right? It's not, it's not, um, it is not anything that I can earn. For by grace we are saved through what? Faith. And that is not of ourselves. It's a gift of God and it's not earned by anything that we do, not by our works, so that we can't brag about it. I love that. Jesus initiates it. He initiated it in us. Jesus on the cross when he dies and pays the sacrifice for you and me, pays that debt, he initiates our faith and he perfects our faith. Not just a good reputation, he is working to perfect our faith. And I just imagine all those who came before looking in wonder and in awe and saying, you have, do you realize what you have? They never had that. They never got to experience that while they were here on earth. But we, if we're followers of Jesus, we get to experience what that's like. 
we get to experience that forgiveness in real time that Jesus is in me and working through me, perfecting my faith so that one day when I am with him forever and eternity, I reach that ultimate perfection and I share in that with them. That's incredible. Second thing I want you to realize is that he did it because of the joy awaiting him. You want to know why Jesus endured what he did? Because of the joy that was awaiting in him. Do you know what the joy is? What is the joy? If we were to pause for just a moment, we could say, oh, it's because of the joy. You understand what the joy is? It's you. You're the joy. I'm the joy. We are the joy that was awaiting him. The reconciliation back to God. The reconciliation that we can have a relationship with him. That is joyous. And I just imagine Jesus being on the cross. And I imagine him looking out and enduring all of the pain that he was suffering. And everything that he was going through. And the thing that was holding him there was the joy. Knowing that we would attain to have a relationship with him forever and ever. That was holding him there. Despite everything that he went through, we were on his mind in that moment. In all of his agony, he is looking into the future. He sees you right here where you are. If you're at home, he sees me, and he says, this is what's holding me there, that we will have a relationship together again. He endured that because of the joy that was before him, you and me. That is awesome. That's incredible. That should make you excited today. Third thing, we got to lose weight. Some of you are like, <clears throat> you're, you know, poking your husband there. When I say that, what I mean is sometimes we have things that kind of weigh us down, don't we? I love what the writer says about this. He says, let us cast off anything that is hindering us, anything that's holding us back. And then he makes a distinction. And especially sin. Sin. And that's interesting because I know that sin weighs me down. I know that my pride, my arrogance, I know that when I am actively in pursuit of my own desires, things that I want, that my flesh wants, like that's sin, right? Anything that goes against the heartbeat of God, like that's sin. But it's almost like there's this other category sometimes where we put things and we weigh ourselves down with stuff that ultimately he doesn't care about at all. We care about it. And maybe it's not sin, but it certainly isn't helping us in our pursuit. It's kind of like, so when I was in the mountains the other week, um, I wanted to take my kids to go see a waterfall. And so we purposely tried to find one that was like the shortest trail imaginable. Because my kids are six, four, and one. And so they're not going to walk very far. They can't climb a lot of stuff. And I know that as soon as we start walking, they're going to be like, I'm done, right? So I wanted to find like the shortest thing possible. So I found one that was about 0.25 miles. Okay, that's not a long walk at all. That is hardly anything. So we pull up to this trailhead, and it is literally the only trail that is at this point. And so everybody who is arriving here, that's the only trail there is. They are only going to walk 0.25 miles to go see a waterfall. So we get out of the car, we get our kids ready, and off we go. We just start walking. And we, we're going to come back and have lunch at a picnic table that's there. And, and we're walking down this trail, and it's smooth. Like, it's not, it's not difficult at all. My one-year-old is walking along. We had to strap her in eventually. But my kids are, like, walking around. There's this little stream with a rock on it. They're like, look, a river! I'm like, it's just a Well, it's nature. For you, it's a river, sure. Yeah, they're not used to it. So they kept walking. They were finding sticks. They were amazed by mushrooms. So we start walking along. And as we're about to turn a corner, my son says, I hear it. I said, hear what? He said, I hear the waterfall. And sure enough, we just round the corner, walk down a little, and there it is. There's the waterfall. Beautiful, awesome, incredibly easy for us to do. It's like a 10-minute walk. It's not difficult at all. Well, we come back to our vehicle, and as we're, like, settling in for lunch there at the picnic table, these other cars are, like, pulling in other families, and I see like dads getting out and parents getting out and kids and these young people getting out. And they're like putting on their backpacks. And they got like these giant water bottles that they're loading in. Somebody's got like a camel bag. They got a straw coming up here. They're getting their hiking sticks all ready to go. And they start setting out. And I'm just thinking in my mind, this is a 10-minute walk. 
you do not need all of that stuff. And sure enough, we sat there for probably about 45 minutes. They start coming back and they're just unloading all of their stuff that they had carried all the way down that they didn't need. And I think sometimes you and I do that. We pack things into our bag thinking that we're going to need it. And Jesus is just like, you don't need any of that. Take it off. Like, just cast all of that extra stuff off. You don't need that. I am all you need. And that's why Jesus says, hey, cast your cares on me. I'll take care of it. That's what I'm here for. I will take it from you. This is why David wrote in Psalms, he said, give your burdens to the Lord. He will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. Sometimes we just need to cast it off and let, let Jesus take it. We put extra burdens on ourselves, extra anxieties and worries that we don't need. We weigh ourselves down with sin, and Jesus says, you don't need any of that. You just need me. Remember, you're the joy that kept him on the cross. It's all, you're all he wants. Last thing we can take away from that passage is to keep our eyes fixed and run. Keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, keeping our eyes fixed on the mountain that is before us, keeping our eyes fixed and not losing sight in the every single day today and wondering, well, where is the mountain? Where is the abundant life? Where is God in all of this? And he's saying, you're on it. You're in it. I'm with you. Keep your eyes fixed and then cast off all that extra stuff. And then he's like, run. Just start running. Don't you want to run? Yeah, I do. I just want to run. I want to run to everything that he has for me. I want to run to everything that he has promised for me. I want to run. And I can't do that with all this extra weight. But if I keep my eyes fixed on him who endured everything that he endured, who saw me and said, that's my joy, and he endured all of that and rescued me, then don't I want to run to him? Don't I want to just keep running in this race and continuing to do whatever that it is that he has for me to do to love others more than myself? to tell the world about him, to share his love with people who need to hear it, to share that message of hope and life with others. Like, I want to run in that. And the entire, all of those who came before are looking at us as followers and they're saying, do you know that you can run? We could only ever walk, but you can run because Jesus is perfecting faith in you in real time. It's incredible. Uh, the writer gives us this amazing analogy which I think is incredible as well, it's beautiful. He says, you have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness and gloom and world, that sounds like a volcano, doesn't it? As the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. You haven't come to that. What he's referencing there is the idea that when Moses was setting out with God's people, God called them to a mountain and, and he was giving them the law, all the do's and don'ts of religion and he was weighing that. That was the covenant at the time that we had to, to live by. That was part of the much bigger plan and it was, it was just this amazing sight. And that's what he's referencing here, that Moses got to go up and receive that law. But they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They were all watching this sight happen and they were like trembling with fear. They staggered back under God's command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. So they were keeping their distance far from that mountain. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. You see the picture there, right? God is there and we cannot be close. But then, check this out. You have come, that's us as followers of Jesus. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Very different than a volcano, right? The heavenly Jerusalem and to countless thousands of angels in joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. Not just good reputation. You have come to Jesus the one who mediates the new covenant. The old one is gone. Jesus mediates the new covenant between God and people and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel when he was murdered by his brother. You understand that that blood spoke out for vengeance but the blood of Jesus offers forgiveness. And because of that, we can come to a different place of joy. So be careful then that you... Do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses and all of the do's and don'ts, 
the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, when he was up there giving the law, his voice shook the earth. But now, he makes another promise. He says, once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation, everything we experience, everything that we see in our day-to-day -day kind of life, everything that we're kind of going along through in our routines, all of creation is going to be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe, for our God is a devouring fire. You see the picture here. I love this phrase, we are receiving. That means it is active. That means it's right now, here, in real time. We are receiving this kingdom that we cannot see. We are receiving this invisible kingdom, like right now, but also in the future. And we sometimes get tripped up on what we're experiencing in the day-to-day, -day, but we are in the process right now of receiving so much more if we would just open our eyes to it. And this last part, this devouring fire, I have to tell you, I've always read that as like, oh yeah, because you couple that with holy fear and awe and you think, yes, God is a devouring fire. He wants to consume me. And that sounds very fearful, but remember, that's not the mountain we came to. We didn't come to a mountain to be fearful of. We came to a different one, one full of joy. And that devouring fire is not to consume us. That devouring fire is to strip everything back that is holding us away from knowing him fully. That devouring fire consumes all of my sin. That devouring fire consumes all of my anxieties and worries and anything else that I pack that I don't need. And that's beautiful. And that creates joy in us. It's not something to be afraid of. He has reconciled us back to himself. It is beautiful. He closes out Hebrews with this prayer, and I think it's appropriate that we share it here. May the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, meaning that Jesus is resurrected. He is alive, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. This new promise, this new covenant, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. Remember, it's, he is all you need, and he gives you all that you need. May he produce in you, because it is his work as the initiator and perfecter of our faith, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him, all glory to him forever and ever. Amen. You see, when we walk with Jesus, when we pursue Jesus, we are not just striving for the absence of sin in our lives, like the law kind of kept us to. We are actually getting to experience the presence of Jesus right here, right now. That is incredible. That should affect our day. That should affect what we put into our bag each day. That should affect how we view the mountain as not some far off thing, but that is, and if we go through our day in real time, that it is going to be shaken, is going to be stripped away. And what we are doing is actively seeing God at work in us, around us, through us. As followers of Jesus, that is what we are called to. This amazing joy that we can have. It's beautiful.